Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Uh, so we'll go ahead and if you recall that we actually dipped our toe in just a little bit to chapter 7 last week, but I'm going to go ahead and do a, a rehash here real quickly. So we're going to go through the first three verses. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness and also king of Salem, which is the king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning nor days, uh, beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So one thing that is introduced in the last part of verse 3 that we didn't really have time to get to last week is uh, we, we did talk about how it's really not saying that Melchizedek is not somebody that had parents. Uh, he's not somebody that didn't die. He's not, you know, like... Uh, uh, some religions and some sects believe the Apostle John is to where he just lived continually and is still alive, roaming around today. That's not what the Hebrew author is saying. And it's interesting that there's actually an early heresy in the church that tried to assert that this is what this verse is saying. If you look at early Christianity, there were a group of Christians, I believe they were either associated with the Gnostics or this was something that was just a, a section of Gnosticism that believed that Melchizedek was actually an angel that he was not a mortal man, and because of this verse, specifically in Hebrews, that it believed that that's what it was literally saying. But that's not what is actually being presented here by the Hebrew author. What he's saying is, from the biblical perspective, we have no record of this. And so, for theological purposes, Melchizedek is somebody that does not have father, mother, genealogy, and he doesn't die. It's not saying that the man Melchizedek that met Abraham literally had that going for him, what it is suggesting is, from the biblical perspective, that is not a thing that is recorded anywhere in Scripture. And so just as the Bible sees it, it does not record him as being a priest only for a certain amount of time, or somebody that had to become a priest at some point in his life and then continued his priesthood. From the Bible's perspective and from what we know about it, the Bible views him as an eternal priest that has neither beginning or end. The only time we ever meet Melchizedek, he's already a priest. And so far as we know, he never died or gave up that priesthood, at least from the biblical record. Now, obviously, we know that eventually he did die. But from the perspective of Genesis, the argument that is being made here in Hebrews is that is not something that the Bible records or talks about the cessation of his priesthood. And so you have to remember that Aaron actually didn't have this, right? He became a priest. We know that. We have that recorded in Exodus 28.1. So we know that there is a time where God call, calls out to Moses, says, bring your brother before me, and I'm going to make him a priest. He had to take the oaths. He had to be anointed. There's a process that goes through that. But from the Pentateuch, from the biblical record, which, remember, was written by Moses, that's not the case with Melchizedek. He just is a priest when he shows up, and he never stops becoming a priest. And we also see that this same thing happens uh, when, in regards to Aaron's death, we see that there is a point where Aaron ceases to be high priest, and that takes place in Numbers 20, verse 28. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son, Eleazar. Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. So here we have a recorded, verified biblical account of Aaron, who was the high priest at one point, now he's not. His priesthood is not something that is uh, innate in him, in other words. Aaron is the high priest, but that is an office he only held for a specific time. Because when this happens and Moses takes the priestly garments off of him, even before his death, at that point, Aaron is no longer high priest. That never happens to Melchizedek anywhere in the scripture. And then we see a little bit later in the same story, Eleazar, who was the one that this office was passed on to, that is taken away from him as well in Joshua 24, 33. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, 
in the town of uh, the town of his son Phineas, which was given to him in the hill of the country of Ephraim. Now we know, uh, continuing on from this account, that actually Phineas is the one that becomes high priest after this, and so we see this succession in the line of high priest. First, it's Aaron, then it's Eleazar, and then when Eleazar dies, that priesthood transfers on to Phineas. So, to be fair, the Pentateuch does describe Aaron's priesthood as an everlasting priesthood, but it talks about it in the collective, not in the individual. It says the priesthood of Aaron is everlasting, but it's talking about that in the sense that it will be carried on through his bloodline, not him. In the same way that the Bible says that, you know, David is going to be a king perpetually before God. Well, that's true in a sense because his crown continued to be passed down through his lineage. But David at one point died and was no longer the king. And so from the biblical perspective, we can see how it's portraying this. And I really think the message that it's trying to drive home here, and this is the point that the Hebrew author is making, is that everything about Aaron's priesthood at some point is temporary and transient. He's not saying that it's insignificant. He's not degrading Aaron. He's just putting Aaron in his proper perspective, which is Aaron, like the Old Testament, served his purpose for a specific time. And when that task was over, his priesthood ended, passed on to another person, and then the cycle continues. That's not true with Melchizedek's priesthood. Melchizedek, at least from the biblical perspective and what we have recorded, is always a priest. Josephus, the biblical historian uh, who is not a Christian, he's a Jew, he records around the time of, of Rome, and this is after the sacking of Rome in 70 AD, that by his calculation, and you know there's some gaps there, so he's doing the best that he can, but he believes that there are 83 high priests since Aaron. And that included some of the illegitimate high priests that happened afterward that were not actually Levites or of Aaron's lineage, they were, they were just appointing people. But according to his record, 83 high priests since Aaron. And so that priesthood continues on, but only through being passed down over and over and over again. That's not true in the case of Melchizedek's priesthood. And as he is about to make this point, that is also not true of Jesus' priesthood. When Jesus is a priest, he is a priest. There's no beginning to that. He doesn't take oaths, none of that. He is, is a priest, and then he stays a priest eternally. So let's go ahead and read verses 4 through 6 here. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest office have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their countrymen, although they are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. And it's a very simple point that he's making here, but essentially this is just another iteration of the argument that Melchizedek's order is like Aaron's, but it's better than Aaron's. And in the same way, which is the point that he's going to make, the other priest that is mentioned as part of Melchizedek's order, Jesus, is also similar to the Aaronic priesthood, but better. And this is something that we understand in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, um, the Montgomery Police Department and the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department, very similar entities. They serve similar purposes. They have similar tasks. Uh, their funding comes from different places, and they're un under different jurisdictions. But we understand that, you know, if you're speeding regardless of whether it's a Montgomery Sheriff's car behind you or a Montgomery Police Department car behind you, they both have the authority to pull you over. And so they serve a similar role in society. However, there are some distinctions, some differences. For example, you may not know this, every sheriff in the state of Alabama is a constitutional officer under the Constitution of Alabama. That's not true of whoever is the police chief in Montgomery County or uh, uh, Montgomery City Police Department. And so we understand this, that there are certain things that serve similar roles and are kind of alike in certain ways, but are different on some level. And that's kind of the point that is being made here with these verses about the difference between Aaron's order of priest and Melchizedek's order of priest. That yes, they serve some similar roles, but ultimately Melchizedek's order of priesthood is a superior one to Aaron. And that's the argument that he's making here. He's saying 
if you look here, that uh, although they are descended from Abraham, and it's talking here about Aaron's priesthood, that even Abraham, who all of the priest's authority at some point derives back to their ancestor Abraham, it's Abraham's connection with God that makes everything after Abraham possible. Even Abraham, the father of the faith for Jews, saw Melchizedek as superior. And we know that by the fact that he paid tithes to it. And so that is symbolic of the Levites themselves doing the same thing. And that's the point that he's making here. And we'll, we'll see this. Oop, I went back one. Uh, we'll see this in the next slate of verses in uh, 7 through 10. But without any dispute, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on. And so to speak through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, has paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of his forefather when Melchizedek met him. So a couple of things here, and this is something that you probably already know, but it bears repeating especially in the time in which this was written. There was a very different social structure, both within and without families at this point. And that is, there was a much greater emphasis on the superiority of the father. You know, you didn't have dads that wanted to be their son's buddies as much back then. It, it was just wasn't a thing that happened. There was a level of respect and reverence. I mean, think about this. One of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and mother. And so this is something that they would have taken extremely seriously. And so he's saying the lesser person is always blessed by the greater. This is something that speaks to that father-son or father-daughter relationship that you have the superior person bringing blessings down upon the inferior. And this was true in a religious context too. You know, the priest actually had the ability to bless people. We see this happening in the Old Testament that they would offer blessings to faithful Israelites uh, for things. Now, they didn't have the kind of authority that Jesus did, but the point is they could offer blessings for Israel. They could offer up prayers and sacrifices for Israel. And because they were the higher in the spiritual hierarchy, as it were, they were able to offer blessings to Israelites. And in turn, just like Melchizedek offered a blessing to Abraham, what he's saying is this is an acknowledgement by both men. Remember, there's very few verses that we have that talk about Melchizedek. It's just a few verses in, in the book of Genesis. And yet, from that one story, we have the basis for this entire argument. That when Melchizedek meets Abraham, Melchizedek gives a blessing, and then Abraham reciprocates with tithing. So both men are engaged in practices that portray the truth that Melchizedek is the spiritual superior to Abraham. And then by extension, the Hebrew author makes this argument that if you're wanting to try to make the case that the priesthood of Aaron is, is greater than Melchizedek because it comes later or it has the law of Moses backing it or something like that, you can't actually make that argument because even Abraham, through which all of Levi's and their tribe's authority comes from, also paid homage to Melchizedek. And that's the point that he's making. And, and this is a concept that might be a little bit foreign to, more, uh, to modern readers. And I think that that's why the Hebrew author hedges his language just slightly here, where you look at it says, it could even be said, or uh, in the New American Standard here in verse 9, so to speak, through Abraham, Levi also paid tithes. So he's saying even the ones that Israel looks to and pays their tithes to because they acknowledge the priesthood of Aaron is, a, is the spiritual superior to them, it is though because Levi was, was still part of Abraham at this point, figuratively, of course, that Abraham also paid tithes to Melchizedek. And so that's the argument that is, is being uh, made here because, of course, uh, this is something that we probably all understand here. I mean, we're all football fans, right? Most of us, at least. So, like, if uh, Auburn um, beats Tennessee and then Tennessee beats Georgia, well, then obviously Auburn could beat Georgia, right? Now, that doesn't always play out in reality the way that we would like it to sometimes. But my point is, this is something that we understand. And, and so, the same sort of transitive property that we see figuratively is happening and being played out in the book of Hebrews. 
So let's go ahead and look at the next few verses. So if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change in the law also. For one for the one about whom these things are said belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. So what he is trying to convey to the audience here is that the Aaronic priesthood is so central to the law of Moses that it cannot possibly be uprooted unless there is a change to the law also. So this is an interesting sort of chain of events that we see unfold in this chapter, is that he makes the first argument that Melchizedek's order is superior to Aaron's order, and then he makes an extensive argument that's saying, and if this argument is true, then you have to concede that there is also a need for an uprooting of the law as its whole. So not only can you not just grasp on to the priesthood of Aaron and say that we want to revert back to that and move away from our newfound Christianity because God obviously ordained the priest of Aaron. He's saying the whole law of Moses is like that. And if I've just proved to you that you cannot rely and cannot put your faith and your salvation on Aaron's priesthood because there is a superior one out there, then that also means the result of that must therefore be that you cannot rely on the law of Moses to do the same either. And he's making the case here that these two things are connected they're so interwoven that you can't root up one without the other. Uh, there's actually a, a legal idea called inseverability. And I'm, I promise I'm not going to get super political. I'm just going to use it as an analogy here. Um, with Obamacare, that was one of the things that became a big point of contention between people that wanted to uproot Obamacare and the ones that didn't because part of it was repealed. And the argument of the ones that wanted to uproot the whole thing, they said, well, the law is inseverable. This is so instrumental. This one part that we got rid of is so central and so instrumental to this law that if you get rid of one and say that that part is unconstitutional, you have to get rid of the whole thing. That was their whole case. And this is essentially exactly the same case that is being made here in Hebrews. He's saying, if you take the, the Aaronic order of priest out, you have no law of Moses. And this is kind of literally true as well, not just because it's central in the sense of its significance, but look at the Pentateuch. What's in the middle? It's Levi. It's, it's the book of Leviticus, which contains all of the laws pertaining to the priesthood. And so you can't have a law of Moses that continues to be in effect if you no longer have the Aaronic order of priests. And the truth is, the Jews living at this time they knew the priesthood that was in place was a sham. They knew it. They knew that for the past two, three hundred years at this point, that the priesthood had been bought, it had been sold, it had been appointed by Romans, it had been appointed by Greeks. There's one case where uh, one priest actually kills another priest to become high priest. And so there's absolutely no question at this point that the high priesthood that is existing in Jerusalem at the temple at this time is a complete sham. It's nothing like what was commanded by the law of Moses. And so it's almost like a dumb moment that is being presented in this argument. He's like, really, this is the thing you want to put your faith in? The priesthood that you know is not the way that God commanded it? And I think that one thing that that does as well is it kind of plants the idea in their mind, why would God allow that? If salvation was supposed to come through Aaron's priesthood, and that was always the plan, why would God allow that to take place? Why would he allow this falling away from his original design? Well, an obvious answer, if you believe in the coming Messiah, is because that was actually his plan all along. He allowed this thing to happen to make way for this. And, and of course, you could later say exactly the same thing about what happens to the temple in 70 AD. It's like God would not have allowed that to happen if his plan was always Judaism in perpetuity because that kind of uproots everything that has anything to do with, uh, with Judaism. 
To this day, even the most conservative, most orthodox sect of Judaism does not offer animal sacrifices. Have you read the Pentateuch? That, that's like one of the main themes. You can't get away from that if you're going to be a Jew the way that Moses recommended you to be a Jew. And so because of that, their religion has essentially been rendered inoperable because of world events that have taken place. And this is sort of along the same lines that the argument that we're reading in these verses is God would not have allowed that to happen if this was always God's plan. We see this in the, the last part of this verse here um, where it talks about the changing of, of the priests and changing of the law. He's essentially saying that the priesthood of Aaron is inadequate and that's why the order of Melchizedek exists in the first place. Um, and he's saying that, you know, from Jesus coming from another tribe, a tribe that never operated at the altar, that of Judah, then Melchizedek is the obvious priesthood that he must be derived from because that's the only legitimate line of priesthood anywhere in the Bible other than Aaron's priesthood. So let's look at verses 14 through 17. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now you remember, because we read the psalm that this is coming from, that when this psalm is being referenced, that is the exact wording of that psalm. You are a priest forever. And he's saying that line was not just poetic flair. It was not merely a, a way to emphasize. No, he's saying it literally means a priest forever. And that is why Jesus fulfills that prophecy in Psalms. Now, there's a lot of things in Psalms that aren't supposed to be taken literally. Uh, it's, it's poetic verse, and we understand this. You know, there's certain things in poetry that are sort of drummed up and, and they're sort of made fancy. There's nothing wrong with that at all, but they're not supposed to be taken literally. And so, especially for someone that lived before the time of Christ, it would not have at all have been out of the norm or an incorrect interpretation to assume that when it says you're a priest forever, it's just emphasizing the importance of Melchizedek's priesthood and the uh, ultimate authority of God's king, which is the subject of that psalm. But can you imagine, this is a song that you've probably sung your whole life. It would be like, to us, um, our God is alive, or I stand amazed, or, or one of those old standards that we're familiar with. And then the Hebrew writer is going back and telling them, oh yeah, by the way, this, this line that you sing, that you've been singing your whole life, that's actually literal. And it was talking about Jesus. And so what's happening here is he's making the point that this is essentially a double prophecy. Because just like Melchizedek is symbolic of Christ before he came, a couple thousand years before he came actually, in the same way that Melchizedek is a, a shadow of Christ and something that is supposed to point to him, we see a thousand years later, David also giving a prophecy using the symbolism of Melchizedek pointing towards Christ. And so the Hebrew author is saying this is a double prophecy, that it comes from Genesis and then it comes from this song that you guys have been singing your whole life and it's been realized in the person of Jesus. How can you say with a straight face, I want to go back to the old way after seeing that? That's the argument that he's making here. And again, this is from a, a strictly rhetorical standpoint, another example of a diatribe. Essentially what is being, uh, what is happening here is that the Hebrew author is doing exactly what we were talking about a few weeks ago, which is anticipating a possible rebuttal of his argument and then heading it off at the pass, basically getting ahead of the argument before somebody tries to counter it. And so that's why he's talking about this uh, dichotomy between Melchizedek and Aaron's priesthood is, is he's saying that um, I know that what you're going to say is, yeah, Moses didn't say anything about anybody from the tribe of Judah being a priest. And the Hebrew writer is saying, yes, you're exactly right, because there was a better priesthood 
earlier that was established that was always intended to be the priesthood of Jesus. It supersedes any physical connection whatsoever. Just like Aaron's priests were all connected by blood, it was all physical. You know, Eleazar had his blood, Phineas had his blood. All of the legitimate priests throughout Israel's history, they were descended directly from the blood of Aaron. So they had a physical, fleshly connection back to God's ultimate will for that priesthood. He's saying Jesus has no connection to that, and he's so superior that he doesn't even need one. That's what's actually going on here is that just like Melchizedek is a priest forever, it says not based on the physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. It's God's authority on which Melchizedek's priesthood rests. And the same is true of Jesus. In the same way that Melchizedek doesn't have that beginning or end of life in the biblical record, Jesus is an eternal priest. And that's why he is better than the priesthood of Aaron that had to be passed along generation to generation. Uh, Any thoughts or comments on that? I've been talking a lot here, and I apologize for that. But uh, that's a good point. He said said nothing versus he said, don't do this. There's not a, a negative command here. Now, it is true that the Bible absolutely says Nobody can be a high priest or a priest of Aaron um, or a, a priest of the Levites unless he comes directly from Aaron's lineage. But he never says that another priesthood couldn't arise from another tribe. So that's an interesting point. I had not thought of that. Um, let's go ahead and, and look at the next couple of verses, unless anybody else had anything. All right. Uh, this is verses 18 through 22. For on the one hand, there is the nullification of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is an introduction of a better hope, through which we come near to God, and to the extent that it was not without an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. By that same extent, Jesus also has become the guarantee of a better covenant. What hope did the law offer? Along those same lines that the the law could not uh, save, I actually remember because, of course, the the world celebrated Easter recently, there was actually somebody that made the tweet that uh, Easter is transcendent and you don't have to be a Christian to appreciate Easter because... Uh, we have risen above such labels and, um, you know, this is the way that you can save yourself. And I was like, hmm, I don't know what seminary that guy went to, but clearly he wasn't paying attention. I don't know of any branch of Christianity that does not make the case that we couldn't save ourselves. If there's a guy that is out there swimming, the lifeguard doesn't need to go out there unless he's drowning, like there, the idea that Jesus would have come to die even though he didn't really have to, read the Garden of Gethsemane. It's clear he didn't want to be there. He wouldn't have done it unless it were necessary. And that's the point that the Hebrew author is making here. He's saying that the law offered no hope, which is the reason Jesus was here in the first place. If it did, there was no reason for the order of Melchizedek to exist. There had to be a better solution waiting in the wings. And this again goes back to Psalm 110 that we were just talking about with with this reference here. God has changed his mind in the Bible. That's true. We see occasions where, now, God does say, I am the Lord, I change not, so his nature doesn't change. But there are times where God was kind of going one way and decided to change his mind on that. We see that when he was angry with the children of Israel with the golden calf. He says, okay, I'll relent from my plan to destroy Israel and just raise up my line through Moses. Okay, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing that. And so we do see clear indications from the Pentateuch of God occasionally changing his mind about something. But he says on this, not changing my mind. The person that is the focus of Psalm 110, which of course we have revealed through the book of Hebrews, was always supposed to be about Jesus. He's saying, I'm not changing my mind on this one. He's a priest. He's a priest forever. His priesthood extends all the way back to creation, all the way forward into eternity. There is no cessation of Jesus's priesthood. And so uh, Jesus is not only the priest, 
But it's interesting here that he didn't need an oath to become a priest. That's the origin of priesthood. When you became a priest, you took the oath. And then if you became the high priest, then you were anointed. Originally, all the priests were anointed. But then after uh, the first wave of priests, then only the high priest was anointed. That's uh, also found in the Pentateuch. But Jesus is the one that became a priest without having to take an oath. Because he merited his priesthood. He didn't have to take an oath because he already had all the qualifications of it. I mean, Jesus wasn't going to break his oath or do something that would have besmirched the priesthood. And because of that, he never had to have an origin point for his priesthood. And that's the point that he's making. It's kind of like in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, let your days be yea and your nay nay and and you have no need to swear. Well, that's what it's talking about here. Jesus' character and merit was so high above the requirements for being a high priest that his priesthood was eternal. He didn't have to earn his way into the priesthood. And ultimately, this is the point of what Jesus was always going to come for. He is the guarantor or the guarantee of a better covenant. Because again, he wouldn't have had to come if the covenant that existed between Israel and God remained intact almost immediately they're on sinai god's presence is felt in the mountain they hear the voice of god and then moses speaks on god's behalf he gives them the covenant he says and if you keep my commandments and if you do all these things i will be your god you will be my people and you will have my special blessing and they said yes we love that sounds good to us we're on board moses goes up the mountain They start working on the golden calf. I mean, we don't know the exact timeline, but it seems like five minutes. I mean, maybe it wasn't quite that quick, but it was less than 40 days for sure. We know for a fact it was less than 40 days because we do have that time mentioned. So it didn't even take them, but at minimum about a month for them to start disobeying the covenant. And so all of a sudden the covenant's broken. Now God eventually did keep that promise regardless of the fact that they broke their part of the bargain. But the point is, that covenant was broken almost immediately, right out of the gate. And so now, through Jesus Christ, there is a covenant that offers forgiveness for that breach in the covenant to take place. That when humans fall, fail, and stumble, that Jesus' blood washes away that sin, therefore the covenant can remain intact. And that's why this is the better covenant is because it actually makes a propitiation for that which the old covenant covenant simply could not do. Jesus is the sacrifice. Sacrifices sealed his oath. It is by his own blood that he becomes the high priest. And and really, he didn't even have to become it because he merited it beforehand, like I was saying. But the point is, um, his sacrifice is one that is worthy. And he took this seriously enough to die for that new covenant. Let's look at verses 23 through 25. The former priest, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, the priesthood had a way to offer a sacrifice for sin, but ultimately it was a band-aid. It was a stopgap. You're relying on a human that has flesh and blood and temptations and fails and sins and eventually dies just like you do. You can't put your faith and your salvation on somebody like that. But, as we discussed in an earlier chapter, You also can't just have God do it because there had to be a human representation to come before God. And so the solution to this problem is have somebody that is both God and human. A human that doesn't die, that doesn't have those frailties, but still understands what it's like to be a person. And so because of that, Jesus is the perfect marriage of those two things that needed to happen for a Savior to be put into place. His salvation, the one that Jesus offers, it's not a band-aid, it's not a stopgap, it's not a temporary thing. This is a permanent solution to the sin problem, to the death problem. And Aaron, 
great as he was, and you'll notice that he doesn't disparage Aaron. He doesn't say that, oh, Aaron's terrible and you don't need to listen to him. He doesn't disparage Aaron or Moses at all here. But what he is saying is it was insufficient by nothing other than the fact that Aaron was a human being too. And so because of that, his intercession was limited by what he had the power to do. He had limitations that Jesus just simply does not have. And so now that Jesus is high priest, there are no limits to what he can do. He is essentially the priesthood has been opened up and has been made permanent. So let's look at the last few verses in this chapter, verses 26 through 28. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all time he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. In this way, Jesus is both the superior priest and the superior sacrifice, and he's both at the same time. Now, this is interesting, and this is going to get fleshed out a little bit more in Hebrews chapter 10, but uh, the, the sacrifice part of it. But as far as his priesthood, it's saying Jesus is not only superior because he's the better high priest, which he's been making this case the entire chapter, but he's also superior because the sacrifice is himself. So his offering as priest is also better than anything that the priests were able to conjure up. The, the only thing that they were able to offer were things that they had available to them, and they didn't have a perfect sacrifice on hand. Through no fault of their own, they just didn't have a sacrifice that was as good as what Jesus had to offer. So what Jesus offered is permanent. It is everlasting, and it talks about this idea of making intercession in perpetuity. And so whereas, you know, the priest of Aaron, they had flaws, they had slip-ups, they had to offer sacrifices for their own sin. Jesus doesn't have that problem. His sacrifice is only for others because he has no need of sacrifice to forgive his own sin. He doesn't have any. And so because of that, his sacrifice is only for those whom he is offering for, and he never has to worry about those things. And it's making the point that, you know, just by their very nature, they were weaker than what Jesus has to offer. You see, the law had qualifications for priesthood. There was a process there. And it was very physical, and there were certain people that could do it and certain people that couldn't. And there were certain things that you could uh, do as far as being unclean that would make yourself unfit for that. For example, you couldn't even mourn a loved one because you would be near a dead body and that would make you unclean. But we see Jesus that is perpetually clean despite the fact that sometimes he touched dead bodies, sometimes he healed them. Because what happens when Jesus does that? Well, they're no longer a dead body anymore. This is a priest that has no limitations because of those things. He can do anything. And in the same way, that the priesthood and the way that it is described and the reason that all of these parameters take place around the priesthood, you'll see it, it occurs over and over again in the Scripture. It says, so that his sin may not be spread out upon Israel. And we see examples of this in Israel's history. We don't have to worry about that with Jesus because he has no sin to spread. In fact, it's kind of the opposite, isn't it? His holiness, his life-giving ability, that is what gets spread among the people when he is the high priest. And so he doesn't have to worry about this ritualistic cleansing that he needs to go through or the sacrifices that he has to offer for himself because he is perpetually that way. He is always clean. He is always righteous. He is always holy. And we know this because just earlier in the, the last couple of lessons that we went over, it addresses this exact problem. He came into a world wrought with sin and yet didn't. And so, if anything, his holiness is contagious as opposed to his sinful nature, which is true of all of the priests of Aaron. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell.
If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman, so if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?